Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Marco Scialdone, um, professor of law at Houston University of Rome in Olo Lab, and I'm the moderator of this panel, Dieselgate in Data Protection, the New Reality of Collective Redress in the UA. Uh, speaking of the devil, just a couple of days ago, uh, Spanish consumers obtained a huge victory in court against Volkswagen. In fact, they have been granted uh, the right to compensation up to 3,000 euros for each for the diesel gate. And uh, this shows once more that the class section can be an effective tool to protect consumers a consumer's right over Europe, and at the same time, it can be a solid argument for opening a dialogue with responsible market players who are willing to recognize their mistake when they happen. And so, this leads us to the main point, the main issue of this panel, which is the new directive adopted in 2020 by the European Union on collective redress. So now we have uh, these two years for the member state to transpose the directive in their legislations. So there is a, a space for improving the directive and to transpose it in the national legislation of the member states. We will debate about this today just to see what is new with new directive, what are the new chances for consumers' right with this directive and the fact that one of the issues uh, that uh, is in the directive is the chance for collective redress even in related to data protection issues. So this is a, uh, something really new. This is something that uh, is in the GP in GDPR, uh, but for the first time, data protection is the, a main issue for the collective redress. So, we will uh, debate about this uh, with uh, uh, four distinguished guests. Uh, we will have uh, Bart Volver Volders from uh, Arcas Law. We will have uh, Laura Sumaini from uh, Pearson Law Firm and the winner of My Data Is Mine Award 2020. We will have uh, Ursula Packel, uh, Deputy Director General of BEUC. And finally, uh, we'll have Paul Braidbart, uh, Director of EU Policy and Strategy at Trust Arc. So, first of all, uh, let me say good morning to our distinguished guests. Uh, and uh, I would like to start our debate with uh, Bart Polvers. Uh, Bart is a, 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 um, a distinguished lawyer at uh, Arcus Law, a, a Belgian law firm, and is a long time experience in uh, class sessions. So I would like to ask Bart to give us an overview of this new directive so that we have a clear framework of what is going to be in Europe with this new class action directive. Thank you, Marco, for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, I will give you um, a very brief and general overview of the new directive. First of all, the new directive um, has been published in the uh, European Journal on the 4th of December. Marco already explained that um, it will enter into force as from 2022. So that means that as from 2023, we can expect the first class actions to be lodged under this new uh, directive. Starting point, it is a new European framework. It is a directive. So that means that it should be transposed into national law. It is not a regulation which is applicable by itself. So it must be transposed into national law. And that means that within the various member states, we still will have some differences in the manner uh, class actions work. Second introductory point is that the directive will continue to be an alternative to national class actions. So that means that you can choose to run the national class action or the uh, system implied by the directive, which perhaps is a damage I, I personally would have preferred to have a single set of rules. Let us look into the substance of this um, directive. What is uh, the framework now proposed by the European legislator? First of all, the scope of the directive, it has a limited scope. It is dealing with class action lodged on behalf of consumers against 
traders. It's not trader against trader, it's consumer against business operators. Yeah, that is the starting point. Those consumers can complain about infringements basically relating to general consumer protection rules. Most of those rules, by the way, have already been enshrined into European law, and you will find the detail of those provisions into an appendix under the directive. Second point. Thirdly, which entities can act before the consumers in the class action litigation? These are qualified entities. Most of the time, public uh, entities, consumer organizations, but they can also be ad hoc uh, institutions set up to counter a specific wrongdoing. Yeah? And there the directive makes a distinction between, on the one hand, the representative organizations or the qualified entities set up locally to lodge a domestic class action. That's something which quite frankly, it's perhaps not so surprising, but the directive also proposes a new category, which is the qualified entities which are allowed to file cross-border representative actions. And there, the directive provides that these entities should provide a number of criteria, independence, transparency, yeah? Uh, uh, these entities should um, uh, fulfill a number of criteria and these entities in other member states have legal standing to act. That is important, it's a recognition of legal standing in other member states, even though perhaps such entity would not meet the specific local criteria of that other member state. I will come back to that in a minute to further explain the cross-border character of the um, directive. Basically, that is the scope. It's a consumer-oriented directive. What is the available redress? What can the organization, the qualified entity, ask for? Again, they can ask for injunctive relief, that certain infringements are halted, or, and, and combine both, they can ask for other redress, for stuff of compensation, that also can be repair, replacement, um, price reductions, for instance, basically to actually allow for the consumers to be properly compensated for. What is not made available under the European Directive is the damages. That means that the compensation granted to the consumers still should be assessed under national law, but it should be a proper compensation. There cannot be a punitive damages being awarded. The consumer cannot receive more than his or her actual losses. Another element which um, is now enshrined into the directive and which I think in most national member states is uh, something which is new, is the possibility for the qualified entities to call on third-party litigation funding. The funds of the proceedings can be funded externally. It should not be funded only through the organization itself that runs the class action. This is a novelty in, in, a, no, in a number of, of European member states. Quite frankly, it is something which exists, is not clearly regulated for. The European Union now has a number of criteria. And those criteria, quite frankly, make sense. The third party funder should not have a conflict of interest. Clearly, you can't have a case funded by a competitor, for instance, that would not be proper. Secondly, the European legislature states that the third party funder ultimately should act in the protection of consumer interests. Quite frankly, that means that ultimately the consumer compensation or consumer interest should be granted. The third party funder can't take the chunk of the compensation out of that, for instance. And thirdly, the 
directive also provides for a court intervention to allow the court to scrutinize third party litigation funding so to assess whether these fundamental criteria are being complied with. This is a novelty because in most national states we have funders but we don't have a legal framework. Now we have a legal framework allowing the um, consumer organizations to call up on uh, those assistance of the litigation funders. Another element which is uh, elaborated for in the um, Collective Redress Directive is a mechanism that allows for settlements to be enforced, approved by the court. This is an interesting mechanism because ultimately, often litigation ends in settlement. The problem of a settlement is that it's a contract, so to say, so it only has effects on the parties to that agreement. What now the European legislator has provided for is that this settlement agreement, by way of a court approval, is also binding for other parties. That means all of the affected consumers can be bound by such a court approved settlement, which obviously is in the interest of the trader because then the trader can end the discussion against all of the potential other consumers around. Secondly, the individual consumer concern will be bound by that settlement, but only to the extent that they don't step out of it. There is still a possibility to step out of the settlement agreement. That's another novelty proposed by the directive, which ultimately will benefit class actions both on the side of the trader and the consumer organization, because any litigation which is not able to come to a final closure is a poor litigation. What parties are looking for is closure in any discussion. The directive Hi. also sets out procedural matters. I will yes. leave those aside. The only thing which I think is directive. I don't hear the that person that I see speaking right now. Closure of evidence. No. That will be organized remains national member states to elaborate on that. That is an element which will, in my opinion, create forum shopping in the sense that in a certain jurisdictions evidence can be disclosed easily, whereas in other jurisdictions perhaps that's more difficult to obtain. So that is an element which will impact on the attractiveness of a certain jurisdiction. Last point, and then I think I explained uh, the overall um, uh, framework of the directive. What is the idea of cross-border litigation under the directive? The directive provides for cross-border representative entities which can file actions in other member states as well. However, the directive does not deal with rules on international jurisdiction. So that is something which will remain under the scope of time. Yes, I so can. That, yeah, often it will be a combination of different entities acting in front of the same court and those proceedings must be joined. I think that that element could have been developed a little bit further by the uh, European institutions. Marco, you gave me 10 minutes to give an overview of the directive. I don't know whether uh, the overview has been met, but in any event, my 10 minutes are up now. <laughs> Thanks, Bart. Really clear. I think that uh, you stress the, the key points of this new directive, especially for the a uh, pan-European class section, uh, the cross-border class section, the fact that we are facing now, maybe for the first time, uh, uh, a single uh, market for consumers. Uh, during the last years, uh, we became familiar with the expression digital single market. I think that we are going to a consumer single market in Europe, uh, even for consumers associations. So this is a, 
a, a big challenge for consumerism and for consumer satisfaction. And I think that this directive, as you expressed, it's a, a great opportunity for consumers association. So, uh, and uh, the fact that one of the points that is stressed in the directive is the data protection leads me to our second guest, a second panelist, Laura Somaini. Laura Somaini uh, is an uh, associate uh, and uh, at, uh, um, oh, sorry, sorry I, I lost, uh, Laura, can you help me? I lost the name at uh, Pistol Law Firm in Brussels. Yeah, exactly. uh, Specializing in uh, IT and data protection law, and the winner of the My Data Is Mine Award 2020. My Data Is Mine Award is uh, an award uh, created by our consumers to support young scholars uh, you know, who have an innovative approach to uh, data protection. And uh, indeed, uh, the uh, paper that was submitted by Laura is a really interesting one. You can find it on the Euroconsumers website. So if you go to euroconsumers.org, you can find and download the paper. And uh, I I'd like to start from the title of this paper because uh, I think it's the, the main point is the rethinking the approach to data protection in the digital uh, era in the digital market. So now we have a, a directive on collective redress and this directive highlight the fact that data protection can be an asset that uh, can enter a class section. So from your point of view, what is the intersection between data protection and collective redress and how can we approach uh, to data protection not just like uh, only as a fundamental value, as a fundamental right, but also as a, an economic asset. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Marco, and good morning to everyone. And I'm very pleased to join this panel uh, this morning. So as uh, Marco introduced, I will speak about uh, the opportunities of the new Collective Redress uh, Directive, specifically uh, in the field of data protection, as well as uh, its interrelation with uh, uh, the regime of the GDPR. So the new directive provides a very valuable opportunity to add an additional and new layer to GDPR enforcement and the protection of data subjects' rights and interests also um, in a different context and especially uh, with the view of um, achieving compensatory redress uh, and uh, which is especially valuable in the case of cross-border actions. But let's take a step back because uh, representative actions also exist under the GDPR. In particular, Article 80 of the GDPR provides on the, white, on the one hand a right for data subjects to mandate organization and other not-for-profit bodies to either lodge a complaint before the data protection authorities or to act for judicial remedies, both against decisions of the authorities and against controllers and processors. These organizations also have, uh, can exercise the right to compensation, to receive compensation on the data subjects uh, behalf, if so provided by national law and we will come back to this point. Uh, on the other hand, Article 80 also contains a second provision, which is to allow member states, so it's their own um, choice, to provide in national law also the uh, possibility of uh, to allow these organizations to also act independently of the data subjects uh, mandate. Uh, however, in this case, and this is a discrepancy between the two provisions, which is also uh, explicitly stated in the, in the relevant recital of GDPR, in this case, without a mandate, the organizations cannot claim compensation on the data subject's behalf. But so, uh, if these representative actions already exist, then uh, what else, uh, what is new and what else do we need? In fact, uh, evidence from stakeholders participating um, in the Commission evaluation of GDPR in 2020, highlighted um, 
in, in most cases that they had uh, noted an increase of complaints before the data protection authorities. However, there was no uh, significant increase in court actions on the other hand. Also, it should be noted that uh, in practice to date, very few member states have uh, a lot, have exercised this uh, possibility of allowing non-mandated actions under uh, the regime of Article 80 GDPR. In fact, only three of them, and Belgium is actually one of them. And this can also lead to further fragmentation and unequal access uh, to remedy uh, for data subjects and consumers across the European Union. However, it should also be noted that there can be some um, recent and actually ongoing developments concerning Article 80 of the GDPR. In fact, in the spring of 2020, a uh, Ger German federal court uh, referred a question for preliminary ruling to the European Court of Justice concerning, uh, among other things, the interpretation of Article 80 GDPR. Uh, in a case stemming from litigation between the Federation of German Consumer Organizations and Facebook. And the court asked uh, the European court um, whether consumer associations and competitors as well, whether they can bring actions for uh, injunctions in their own name, if it is so provided by um, national law. And in fact, the exact scope of the right to act remains under national law. And actually, just days ago, in January 2021, also the Austrian Supreme Court referred a similar question to the European Court of Justice uh, concerning Article 80 of GDPR. So it may well be the case, and this is very welcome, that the Court of Justice uh, will uh, interpret and clarify further the scope of Article 80 GDPR, which will also bring more awareness to this regime and uh, hopefully help uh, trigger greater um, availability of this source um, and this regime, as well as bridge further with uh, consumer protection organizations. And this leads me then to, um, to the new regime with uh, the collective uh, redress directive, uh, which as I mentioned in the beginning, constitutes a further opportunity. So it is a new, it, it is an additional um, instrument to act for collective redress in the field specifically of data protection among others. So how do these two instruments relate? Um, so the two types of actions under GDPR and the new directive are broadly complementary and the directive uh, in principle is without prejudice to, to the GDPR. However, there are also a number of issues which um, Sorry, which, uh, for example, as Bart already mentioned, there are uh, specific standards under the new directive for uh, entities to qualify as so-called qualified entities in order to act under the new directive, which are different from the, the conditions set by Article 80 of the GDPR, uh, which is um, much less uh, precise and also leaves open to national law further specifications for organization to, to be able to act under national law. Uh, there are also procedural issues. So the directive is much more uh, prescriptive in terms of uh, procedure, whereas the GDPR is entirely silent on this aspect. Uh, and it's notably left to national procedural law. And another important note, which was um, again noted by, by Bart, is that GDPR has no express reference to cross-border actions in the case of Article 80 GDPR. So uh, a specific added value that the new directive will bring is the opportunity to act in uh, cross-border actions to fight um, widespread behaviors which call for uh, European-wide um, actions for redress. And finally, another very important aspect is that concerning the estimation of damages for uh, consumers and data subjects in this context. As, um, 
as Bart already mentioned, both the directive and it's the case also for the GDPR damages it are under um, the rule of national law. And we know that from the GDPR that data subjects specifically are entitled to receive both material and non-material damages. But it will be interesting to see how this uh, plays out in practice and whether also new and different approaches can um, will be will be de developed in this uh, area specifically finally i would like to conclude on a on a positive note so uh, remarking also some very positive and welcome um developments that the new directive will bring in particular one important aspect is that under the directive we might also see uh, actions which uh, fight uh, or react to unlawful behavior, which can potentially trigger different provisions of EU law and EU instruments, uh, provided that they are covered by the scope of the new directive. One very clear example can be the case of, um, of practices which trigger violations of both GDPR and e-privacy rules. And this can could further be expanded in the realm of online and digital services to also other consumer law uh, legislation. Finally, it will bring uh, it will certainly bring improved um, redress and compensation uh, mechanisms for data subjects at large, and it will also raise the stake for compliance to uh, for data pro processors and controllers who will face the increased uh, scrutiny and increased uh, risks of litigation and which hopefully will also push them into better comply and better respect data protection. Thanks, thanks Laura. Uh, really clear and I, I think that once again what we have seen uh, is that the cross-border action can be key point of this uh, new directive uh, and because it, it, uh, this is a mechanism that enlarge what is already mentioned in GDPR as you said and uh, can define a new role for consumers association it is a uh, something that uh, push consumers association to uh, cross the national borders and to cooperate together to create a more sustainable ecosystem for consumers uh, and I think that we can discuss this with uh, our next guest um, that uh, is the Deputy Director of uh, BEUC, Ursula Paco. Ursula, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Marco. Okay. BEUC uh, as, uh, uh, is the European Consumer Organization representing 43 independent national consumers association for 32 European countries. So this is uh, just in line uh, with what I just said, the need for a European approach to consumers protection. So in this sense, I would like to to ask you, how do you see the role of consumers' organization in the new directive and in general in a new path of consumerism? I mean, uh, traditionally, consumer association has always been saw, uh, seen as uh, uh, the fighting uh, um, party for consumers, but they can also play a role, I think, uh, uh, in a dialogue with uh, responsible market players uh, just to try to prevent uh, instead of only uh, fighting with uh, with these market players i think that there are some lessons that we can uh, uh, we can try to uh, to explore it a, a little bit better and uh, i would like to ask you what do you think about this this is a, a new role for consumers associations in the coming year uh, even uh, thinking about the role that uh, uh, in the new directive is designed for consumers as well. Okay, well, thank you very much, Marco, for this introduction and thank you very much for having me on this panel. Indeed, and maybe let me start by just putting this a little bit in the 
into the context of, of, of consumer law history and which is also the history of the consumer movement and indeed when this directive representative action directive was adopted finally this year it was a really really big moment for consumer organizations and for European consumers and why so because uh, European consumer law uh, as you know is very good in terms of the substance of it we have many rights but european consumer law has always had one achilles heel and that was the problem that enforcement was difficult particularly because we don't have or we did not have what for example the american consumers have the us americans have class actions and we didn't have that so BIOC, for example, and our members, we've been fighting for collective redress for decades. So this is not only about a few years, but uh, I'm in, in consumer policy since more than 20 years and it has always been a big issue. And I think um, the opposition that we faced, particularly from industry, uh, who did not um, hesitate to bring all of uh, all types of phantoms into the discussion about introducing class actions into uh, Europe with what you mentioned punitive damages and enormous uh, uh, sums that would have to pay uh, would have to be paid by businesses that that had quite a, a strong impact unfortunately on European institutions and it took the diesel gate uh, to really give it final go. Uh, and so finally we have that. So that's really the good part of the digital gate that it led the European institutions to really do it. Um, and let me maybe also say what is the situation now so that we understand how big the change is and how big also the role for consumer organizations to bring better access to justice for consumers. Um, in the digital gate situation, we have now um, a few consumer organizations who have brought collective redress against Volkswagen and there is good chances that they will have um, a successful outcome. We've just, as you mentioned, Marco, we have just had the Spanish uh, decision, uh, which is very positive. And we have um, also actions pending uh, in uh, Portugal and in Belgium and in Italy. And we had the German settlement, which is based on a specific law, but the rest of Europe the rest of European consumers, they will not probably, unfortunately, not come to any compensation, despite the fact that they have suffered the same damage. So for the time being, access to justice in Europe is very unequal. It is fragmented. And so this is why this new directive is such a big success for consumers. Um, and because it has the GDPR in its scope also for data subjects and for citizens. So I think it, it's really important to underline that. Uh, and let me also uh, say something because I was really grateful that Bart and Laura, both of you, you mentioned what the GDPR has currently uh, in its scope and what it has not. And that has been a huge issue. issue. So the myth busting that we have to do, there is no collective redress. Uh, in the GDPR and this is why it was so important to have this directive because it has been used a lot in lobbying uh, by the industry that we don't need the um, representative action directive to include the GDPR in its scope because we have it already but that's not the case so there is non-mandated uh, representative action for getting compensation for a group of consumers it's only in the represent representative action directive and this is why it really fills a vital gap that was dearly needed. So I think it's not overestimated to say that this directive is going to open up a new era for consumer protection, a new era for access to justice and consumer organizations are explicitly mentioned in the directive as those that should be mentioned or should, sorry, should be nominated by the member states if they qualify um, for being uh, a qualified body under the directive and they have already in some countries where it's possible they have already a lot of experience and starting to do uh, collective redress also in areas of data protection infringements just to name uh, that currently our members in Spain, Portugal, Italy and Belgium have a group action, a collective action pending against Facebook uh, over privacy infringements and we also have our French member UFC Cujoisir that has uh, last year um, uh, started a collective redress action against Google uh, for um, uh, illegal processing of um, the local, uh, 
localization data of its users. So there is already a uh, starting um, action where, where it can already be done. Um, the other point, and you mentioned that I think it's an important role for consumer organizations, is that it's not only that consumers can group together. The directive allows consumer groups to come together. So that is really, I think, quite revolutionary and very, very necessary because in the data economy, data protection is so important. And we have some very, very big companies who do not have very good records in respecting European legislation. And I think the GDPR is still in its infancy when it comes to tackling these quite widespread infringements by these big companies. And the fact that we have now private enforcement possible will be, I think, a huge incentive for the market to play to the rules and for these big countries, uh, companies, sorry. So it's, it's a little bit of a, a David versus Goliath situation, but the fact that consumer organizations can gr uh, group together and make really a European case when there are European practices, and this is the internal market dimension uh, that is very important here, it makes, uh, it makes a big difference. Uh, and then there is another aspect because indeed uh, the, the scope of the, um, of the directive in terms of what substantive laws can be a legal base for collective action is, is not very limited. We have 66 legal acts that are in the annex, so it's a broad scope reaching from classical data protection, but also uh, going into passenger rights, into financial services uh, protection, um, into telecom uh, regulation, et cetera, et cetera, health uh, um, uh, services, medical devices, what you have. And so issues about data breaches and data security may also play a very big role uh, in, in the future uh, with regards to this. Um, and now maybe let me come to the last point that you mentioned, Marco, about settlements and what is the role of consumer organizations. Indeed, that is a very interesting and very exciting question. There is, uh, as was mentioned, I think, by, by Laura and by Bart, there are provisions in the new directive uh, where either the, the, the parties can come together and say, look, judge, we made a settlement uh, and, and that could be a good uh, end to this uh, situation or the judge can promote and ask the parties to come forward and, and make a proposal. Um, we will see how this is going to play out. Uh, the experience is that um, many companies uh, so far have not been very interested in amicable settlements. That's the experience of our member organizations. So the big question is, is the stick big enough? Is the, is the representative action directive really a big enough incentive to put it positively that companies will really sit down and start to negotiate and we will have to be very careful because what we learned from the settlement that has been reached on the dieselgate again in germany is that it only covered german consumers um, because well volkswagen uh, said we cannot uh, have other consumers in the settlement and the judge probably was also not very inclined to do so because of the complication with the applicable law because normally the consumer in such a situation would have his own national law applicable and so the international private law rules that are not harmonized uh, in this respect by this directive they may come into play and and have to be considered very carefully how to make the best use out of this. So um, to respond to that, I think settlements will be very, very interesting uh, and, uh, and there will be indeed be a new role for consumer organizations, but um, it takes two to tango and we will have to see whether companies see these things in the same way. So let me say what I said uh, to conclude a new era for consumer protection, for access to justice, for justice and for equal treatment, I think, has come um, now forward with this new directive and we'll see how to make the best out of it and truly consumer organizations are ready uh, and are waiting impatiently uh, for the application date in 2023. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, let me say that maybe consumers organization the future should be able to negotiate the algorithm with the platform. So they should try to prevent 
the any abuse even before the abuse is in place so they should start working with the market players uh, at, a, at an early stage to negotiate the algorithm just like uh, uh, um, i mean uh, everything uh, uh, there is a question from the audience that is uh, really interesting uh, about this uh, i uh, i will go through it uh, it's uh, sorry for the pronunciation i think it's lexo zardia shibli uh, and the, the question is these companies that operate social media search engines are often accused by scholars that their practice uh, targeted advertising violates autonomy this infringement is argued to be both outside the consumer protection law as the economic harm caused is impossible to calculate or a harm to be me measured economically nor it is covered by personal data protection because practice uh, uh, example a b testing do not necessarily need personal data can a case uh, against such an infringement be brought to court under the new section directive uh, i think this can be a, a question for uh, all of you and uh, I, I think this is a, a point that is really important in this question is the economic value of data uh, in case uh, of, uh, uh, of an arm that uh, uh, um, regards the, the data protection, because uh, it's really difficult uh, to evaluate uh, the economic damage in case uh, of uh, data breach, for example. Uh, my I would like an, a, a question to, to this. Do we need to think to punitive damages uh, regarding data protection in the European Union. Can be this uh, a mechanism uh, to implement a little bit better the new directive? I don't know if any one of you want to answer to this uh, question. You, Ursula, you want to start? Yes, I mean, that, that's a long list of fundamental questions. It's hard to, to answer, but um, I think, uh, first of all, as you know, the GDPR in Article 82 clearly stipulates, it stipulates that it's not only about material damage, it's also about non-material damage. And it's true that I think there is not so much experience uh, with how this will be calculated and courts have probably tended to be uh, rather restrictive. Um, but I think, um, what um, what is important is is to see that this is not about the value of the data, but is the damage that has done to the consumer and to the protection of the consumer or the data subjects and to to his or her privacy. And so, if you interpret that in the perspective of that the uh, the law must be effectively applied and enforced, I think uh, it, it it has quite um, a dimension that also for immaterial damage you will get compensation. And uh, the question that was asked by the audience about the uh, the influence um, or the manipulation, let me say, if I rightly understand, of the autonomy, uh, I think um, that, I mean, the question is, is it really the case that this does function without personal data use? In the case of doubt, I would always say personal data is implied, so the GDPR would apply. And if not, there is still other tools that are in the scope of the uh, representative action directive and for commercial practices. And though there is a condition that they can only be used if the unfair practice has had an impact on the, the um, decision of the consumer, on the transaction of the consumer, that would be perfectly the case if a consumer is manipulated uh, and cannot make an autonomous decision. So I think it's not so hard to see how this could be tackled. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I will, uh, there is a, another short question from uh, Robert Romain. Uh, good morning, which country would have implemented the article 8, paragraph 2, uh, I suppose, of the GDPR? Belgium is not definitely one of them, however, thank you. Uh, what I can say from uh, uh, Italian point of view is uh, Italy is one of the nation that implemented the paragraph two with the decree 101 of 2018. Uh, but there, uh, as far as I know, uh, there has no be a application of this uh, up till now. Um, I don't know, but the, the, uh, uh, in, in Belgium, uh, uh, our 
uh, uh, the, the reason he says that that there are no uh, implementation of the of this paragraph. Yeah, um, uh, I'm also unaware of any Belgian uh, position on that. So I think from the, the side of Belgium, um, I, I don't think we can uh, provide any, any relevant uh, input there. That is uh, my assessment. So uh, I think that we can uh, skip to our uh, uh, last but not least guest. Uh, uh, just uh, 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 to, to face uh, one of the main points that we have tackled uh, uh, one moment ago uh, is uh, the economic value of data, because data has always been conceived as a fundamental right and of course they are, but more and more there is the perception that there is a, a, an economic value of data, that data can be an asset for companies, uh, they can thrive on data of course, uh, and uh, of course there is a role of consumers uh, in this uh, economic value. So they, um, it must be clear that in some way they have to receive something back for the use of their data um, in this new data economy. So I would like to uh, um, to, to stress this point with uh, uh, Paul Braybart uh, from Trustark. Uh, if you could say uh, just uh, some words about your company that is really focused on compliance and privacy law, and uh, uh, I think that it's the best way to underline how data protection is becoming an asset for companies. Yes, good morning, everyone. Absolutely. And um, it is one of the reasons why I started working first at Nimity and following the Nimity acquisition by TrustArc now at TrustArc is to help companies be better compliant. Uh, my history is with the Dutch Data Protection Authority. Um, and since four and a half years, I'm in the private sector. But I always wanted to continue in, in working on those compliance issues because with the law becoming um, more prominent, but also more complex with more and more data being used, um, I think it is important that companies actually understand their requirements. Um, and indeed, over the past five, six, seven years, we have seen that um, compliance software has become an industry of itself. Um, but I'm not here to, to promote compliance software. I'm, I really want to, to focus on the issues. And, and you are right. Personal data is absolutely of a large monetary value for lots of companies around the world and not just the big tech companies that are really data driven. I think every single company around the world nowadays um, is working on the basis of lots of data and doing their analysis to uh, find patterns, to find trends, to see how they can further improve their offering. Um, and of course, to keep in touch um, with their customers and, and their other uh, business partners. Um, so the amounts of data that a company holds from large social network companies to the butcher around the corner um, has massively increased. And that also means that the risks are a lot bigger, that there are more possibilities that things could go wrong if um, anything, uh, uh, if a data breach, for example, occurs, if data are stolen. Um, we've just have a big scandal here in the Netherlands um, that the public health services uh, databases were breached for all the people who took COVID tests, which includes their social security number, national identification number, um, lots of other very sensitive information, of course. Um, so also in those situations, I do see uh, lots of opportunities uh, for representative action and collective redress. Um, Laura already mentioned Article 80, and I think that is really a breakthrough provision in data protection law, um, because data protection law is not easy because of all the open norms that it contains, because of all the international guidance that is available, uh, differences also in administrative law uh, from member state to member state. So it is really helpful that there are more professional organizations that would be able to um, advocate for your rights on your behalf. Um, just as a side note, you just mentioned uh, the possibility to negotiate the algorithms as, as part of their work. 
Um, that is actually included in the GDPR as well in Article 35 on the data protection impact assessments. Um, companies can be uh, asked to also involve data subjects or their representatives as part of the DPIA process. <laughs> So also there, those collective redress organizations um, and representative organizations would be able to play a role in my view. Um, and there is another reason why collective redress under GDPR is important because there is a lot of dissatisfaction on the enforcement of GDPR by data protection authorities. I don't always agree with the dissatisfaction because I see that the DPAs are working very hard, that they get lots of complaints also because there are there is more attention for privacy and data protection these days, and they are insufficiently resourced by our governments all across Europe. There is not one single DPA that has sufficient resources to deal with all their tasks. And even if we would double those resources overnight, um, you can't find sufficient experienced privacy professionals to make sure that all those investigations are up and running in no time. So before the DPAs are fully uh, able to deal with all the challenges of, DP of the GDPR and other privacy laws, um, that will take a few years, um, maybe, maybe at least five years. Um, and in the meantime, we do want to fight for our rights. And the GDPR does allow to go to court directly. Um, it does now allow to use collective redress, to use representative action, um, and that might be the solution, uh, especially uh, to get more case law, um, hopefully also to get the Court of Justice of the European Union involved to maintain consistency. Um, but it would be, I think, a lot faster than um, in every single case waiting for the DPAs. And that is also where for businesses the danger is. Um, yes, DPA investigations will always be challenging, but to be uh, immediately uh, challenged before the courts, especially by professional organizations like uh, None of Your Business from Max Schrems, um, who's now even fighting on behalf of members of the European Parliament, uh, but also other initiatives here in the Netherlands. We have the Dutch Privacy Collective with a case against Oracle and Salesforce. Um, if those are successful, I believe that many more will follow. Um, and that is indeed where the money is, both in terms of, um, of damages, but also just in, in uh, litigation costs for companies. Um, so that may take, uh, may take quite uh, some money. And I think there are lots of ways where um, representatives, where citizens um, could go to court uh, and fight for their rights. And that includes um, uh, the compatible use of personal data, uh, further processing, uh, but also in, in more recent court cases, we saw decisions on dark patterns uh, being used, for example, with cookies. We saw yesterday the Grinder case out of Norway. I think there was lots of users of dating apps um, who may feel that uh, they could challenge those companies uh, in court. Um, and only this morning, the Dutch DPA gave an interview in one of our daily newspapers stating that he believes that he needs the power to impose collective damages as well as part of a sanction in case wrongdoing is found in investigations. Um, so there is a lot of movement here. And I think it's important. I think it will help um, companies to stay focused on privacy and data protection issues. And I think it will also help um, in the end to uh, get a better understanding of where the boundaries of data protection will are. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And uh, uh, definitely, I think that uh, the, the, the economic value of data is uh, something really challenging for consumers associations uh, and uh, for the future of consumerism. I saw there are uh, some questions about it uh, in uh, our audience. Uh, I will try to go through it. I'm approving it. And uh, uh, there is a, a question for Ursula um, is about the uh the settlement that uh, uh facebook reached in the united states with the federal trade commission and the question is uh, if there is something similar that could happen in europe too uh, but i think that the the situation is pretty different because in uh, um, the collective redress regards the individual rights uh, of consumers in that case was uh, an 
administrative uh, authority, but uh, I, I will give you the floor to Ursula to answer to this. Yeah, thank you. I, I have to say I don't know enough about the Facebook uh, settlement in the US to say whether this is feasible um, in, in Europe. But uh, as I said before, we already have uh, some consumer organizations in court with a collective redress uh, legal action against Facebook and obviously a settlement uh, is always possible. So I think um, if, if, if that is the question, I think yes, absolutely. Um, and uh, and we, as I said before, <clears throat> we just have to see what um, these big companies that could face similar lawsuits in other countries, how they consider the risk of having to settle in one country compared to uh, still waiting rather to be sued, uh, which is currently the case because we don't have collective redress uh, in all countries. So, yes, it could happen, of course. We have another question, uh, I think, for Bart, that uh, in many cases, the actual remedy that individuals or consumers, privacy organization might want to seek is not compensation, but injunctive relief, namely that the controller stop the relevant processing. To what extent might collective redress be able to assist here? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good question, actually. Under the uh, new directive, basically it is made clear that uh, member states in their national law must at least provide that collective redress allows for injunctive relief, for instance, uh, to see certain activities, and other redress, which can be compensation. So basically, injunctive relief is one of the elements which the uh, class action uh, directive allows for. One. Secondly, is that something which is in the interest of consumer? Quite frankly, I think it is because injunctive relief looks at the future, um, whereas redress basically often looks at the past, actually. So injunctive relief is an important mechanism to allow consumer law to be upheld. In most jurisdictions, at least in Belgium, injunctive relief is already available, but now it should be um, provided for uh, throughout Europe. And uh, another question, uh, I think, Laura, you can uh, tackle this, is how to address the lack of privacy knowledge uh, with judges who have a, a very broad scope? This is a, 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 a very good question because, uh, yeah, especially on data protection, uh, sometimes in course they do, do not have the sensibility to tackle these, uh, these issues. Yes, indeed, this is a... Uh, um quite a big uh, issue and uh, problem. So it will take a lot of effort and a lot of expert knowledge. Of course, the more uh, organizations who specialize in data protection and digital rights uh, act and bring their expertise, then uh, the more also judges and courts can improve in, uh, in this context, whether experts might be necessary in courts this is um um maybe too much to say but uh it's definitely an important work that has to be done to to improve this and in any case national courts have been progressively dealing with these issues more and more so hopefully also time will help uh to, to improve expertise in this field Thank you. We are. Uh, we have ten minutes left, so I would like to briefly ask you two questions. Uh, basically, the first one is uh, about the procedure of this new class action, because, as you know, the member state uh, will be able to decide on opt-in or opt-out procedures. On your experience, which one is the best for consumers? For example, in Italy, we have an opt-in system, which has proven to be particularly difficult to implement for consumers associations and really expensive. So from my, from my experience, uh, I would definitely opt for an opt-out system. But I would like to, to know your opinion on this. And the second question is on uh, third-party funding that 
for me it's really interesting because uh, uh, the the class session can be really expensive for consumers associations so the fact that we can have uh, a uh, third party that funds the class section is it good, but this can undermine the independence of the consumer association. So uh, I would like to have your opinion uh, on this. I don't know who want to start on this. I, I perhaps I, I can go very yeah. briefly, Mark, on that. Um, um, first of all, opt out, opt in. I think um, the, the clear preference should be opt out. The reason is that um, opt-in is very difficult to obtain uh, for the organization collecting all the consumers. And secondly, opt-out gives you leverage to come to a settlement uh, with um, the relevant companies involved. So I think that provides a clear benefit for the organizations. Secondly, in relation to third-party funding, which is quite frankly a novelty, I think this is um, a very welcome evolution, but I think there is a risk also involved with it because these are private entities supporting litigation. We should be careful that certain discussions, which for a uh, third party funder are not that interesting from a monetary viewpoint, are not fall outside of the possibilities to act in litigation. Because if all of this is being commercialized, we will see certain class actions not be able to continue because they are from a third party funder perspective, perhaps less interest. And I think that is something which uh, should be looked into also. Thank you, Bart. Uh, maybe Ursula, you want to jump in? Yes, very quickly on the two questions, both very relevant, uh, of course. Uh, so I would fully agree with Bart that opt out is, is the way to go. Uh, we have seen that from the experiences we have in the different countries that opt in is quite cumbersome, can be very uh, cost intense for the consumer organization. They have to publish the calls for consumers to make themselves known, could to come forward, etc. And as Bart also said, of course, the the impact uh, and the incentive again uh, also for companies to sit down and try to reach a settlement maybe is much bigger if if you come with with uh, with the whole consumers who are affected um, and you don't have to go to reach out for opt-in so that's clear it could also be a solution that the judge has discretion to decide whether opt-in or opt-out uh, applies in a specific case. So that's something which exists in some uh, member states. So that could be a regulatory option for, for a country to implement, which would be possible. Um, and the third party funding, just a little um, comment because Bart said this is a novelty. It is a novelty maybe in Belgium, but definitely not in all European countries. We have um, Austria, for example, where uh, the consumer organizations do great work uh, in bringing um, uh, companies to court uh, and, uh, and holding them accountable and also paying compensation. And they do that uh, in all cases, basically, only because they can have third party funding. And that has worked very well. And I really don't see any reason why it could be not as well done in other countries. And there are these flanking measures in the directive that were mentioned, I think, by you in the beginning, Bart, that the judge can request um, to have insight into the contracts, that there is a scrutiny uh, and that it must always be in the interest of the consumers. So I think there is enough uh, to make sure that third party funding will be successfully applied always in the interest of consumers. I, I don't have worries about that. Thank you. Thank you, so uh, Laura, do you want to add something? Not specifically on this question. One thing I wanted to add and going back to the very first question that was raised, it's also to be aware that the notion of personal data is very, um, very large, expansive and dynamic in nature. And the Court of Justice has been increasingly uh, interpreted interpreting it in that way so uh, this can also provide additional leeway to act, to act also in the in the specific realm of personal data and GDPR yeah 
sorry, sorry, I, I was on mute. The, the, the sentence of 2020. And uh, <laughs> Paul, of course, as a company representative, I think you are definitely in favor of an opt-in system because <laughs> it's the best for a, for a company. But I, I, just just kidding, I, I, I would like to, to know your opinion on this too. Well, I, I believe that um, uh, what Ursula said, that probably the opt-out is the fairest system for individuals. Uh, but of course, also when dealing with these issues, we need to make sure that everything is GDPR compliant um, and for organizations to obtain all those consumer data um, might also be a challenge before they can actually start reaching out to individuals to, um, uh, to, to represent them. Um, so um, I have no strong preference uh, opt-in over opt-out. Uh, I haven't given that particular issue um, a lot of thought yet. Um, but I do believe that also if we if we do move towards collective redress, which, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm very much in favor of, um, also that part should be done in a compliant way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. And our, our time is running out. We have, we have only three minutes left. I would like to thank you for this uh, amazing debate uh, on uh, new collective redress directive based uh, on the uh, reaction from the audience, uh, I think uh, it has been uh, appreciated uh, and uh, it was very clear the contest that we are moving and uh, the future of collective redress in Europe. So I would like to thank you once again. And uh, uh, so uh, I, I want to wish you a good day to everyone and to everyone in, in the audience. Uh, and uh, please continue to follow this uh, beautiful event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.